Okay. This is Micah. All right. All right. Micah's been coming for three months now. All right. And for some reason, this week, I've had a whole lot of people say, who's that new guy? And I'm saying, okay. I that not have been in church for a while. Yeah, <laughs> that, that is Micah, all right? And this is my uh, friend Lisa also. She's all right, welcome Lisa. Welcome mine, Lisa. Yeah. So uh, Micah has joined our worship team uh, in September. So you've been seeing him up there sometimes leading, sometimes playing an instrument. And we are just so happy to have him as part of our worship team around here. So um, it's terrific. And then there's Randy. Hi, Randy. Well, I, well, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't want you to feel bad because you're my favorite pianist. I, we don't, no, he's not. No, he's not. Well, no, he, never mind. I'm going to get in trouble. <laughs> he's really old. But, it, <laughs> but good morning. Welcome to New Hope. It is great to have you with us for our worship today. If, uh, if you are a guest, it's your first time here, you honor us by choosing to worship here today. Um, and we'd love for you to do something for us and hopefully for yourself. There is a communication card in the pew in front of you. I would love for you to take it out, fill it out, and put it in the offering bag when church... Uh, uh, when, it, when it comes by, we promise we're not going to beat on your door. We're not going to bother you on the phone. But uh, Tuesday of this week, we will put out in the mail to you uh, information about the church, about our staff, about the ministries and services we have, ways you can connect if you choose to. And uh, there's even an area if you want more information on a particular area of ministry, you can check that and we will follow up with that. So uh, we would love for you to do that. And those very same cards are also for our church family. Uh, if you have messages to our staff, if you have prayer requests, updates that you want to give us about other prayer requests, take the opportunity to do that on the card every Tuesday morning. Our staff gets together. We go through those cards. We pray for the requests that are on them, and then we take care of what uh, the requests are that are there. And so we would love for you to do that today. Thank you very, very much. Hey, it seems like winter showed up this morning, huh? We kind of went from summer to winter very, very quickly, but uh, it feels great, and I'm enjoying it. It feels like November now, so um, I'm kind of glad for all of that. Let me highlight some announcements and then a few updates on prayer requests, and then we will get engaged in, uh, in, our, in our ministries this week. Um, tonight, we, we have Sunday night service. Every since September, we have regular Sunday night services from 6 to 7, 15, uh, over in the Bridge Building. And just a couple of weeks ago, we had something really, really special. We had one of our uh, young college students preach his first sermon to the church. And Rick did a great job. Sunday nights gives us an opportunity for you to hear other members of our staff preach, to hear some of our young people engage and lead in worship. Uh, it's a great way to get acquainted with some other people that you don't meet on a Sunday morning. So uh, it's not designed necessarily to replace Sunday morning, but if you can't make it, you have another alternative. Uh, you just need a little something extra, come out on Sunday nights, or you just want to get better acquainted. We would love to see you. But tonight at 7 o'clock is going to be a little bit different. And it will be here in the sanctuary. Uh, tonight's one of those rare moments that we have in church life. Uh, we are going to have an ordination service. Um, some of you are saying, what in the heck is that? Um, an ordination service is what we do uh, for a person who believes that God has called them into ministry, that God has called them to preach the gospel. And there's two steps to the process. The first one is what we call a license. And uh, the church votes on that person and says, yes, we recognize God's call. And for a particular period of time, one year, two years, uh, it's kind of like getting a driver's permit. Okay, you're not allowed to fly solo yet or all on your own, but under supervision, okay? Uh, and, and so that is where our youth pastor and our associate pastor's been. They've been licensed uh, under our church for the last two years. And uh, earlier this year, we brought them to the entire church family and said, uh, we believe that they are ready for this next step and we need to go uh, and, and ordain them. And, and we follow some biblical directions here. It's the laying on a, of hands of the elders upon those, uh, upon those individuals praying for them, charging them with what the mandate from Scripture is for someone who God has called uh, into ministry. There, there are lots of pursuits that we can do in our lives uh, that we can do with talent. There's lots of pursuits in life that we can do with hard work. There is one particular pursuit that you better have more than talent and you better have more than hard work, and that is ministry. 
it better be a call of God in your life, all right? Because to try to do it with talent alone, to try to do it uh, with hard work alone is going to end up in a crash and burn situation. It requires the all-sufficiency of Christ, knowing that this is God's. All of us have been called to be ambassadors of Jesus Christ, but the Scripture says God has called some to be teachers and some to be preachers. And, and, and so those are what we're recognizing tonight, that Chris and Mark have decided this is God's call on my life, and the church has recognized it, and we are going to ordain them this evening. Uh, you are going to see them dressed probably nicer than you may ever see them dressed again tonight, because I've told them they had to dress up for tonight. Um, you don't have to put on a coat and tie, but you would also be okay if you put on a coat and tie for tonight. Uh, this is kind of like a seminary graduate, a master ceremony. Uh, and so that will be tonight from 7 to 8 o'clock. And afterwards, we're going to have a reception over in the multipurpose area in the bridge building. And um, cards are appropriate. Gifts are certainly appropriate. Uh, but your attendance will be most appreciated for this very, very special evening tonight. Um, next Saturday, Widow's Lunch Bunch is going to be meeting at the Clovis Memorial Building for a concert. And then afterwards, they're going to the Gastro Grill for, uh, for a meal. Next Sunday, November November the 12th, several things are happening. Uh, number one, it is the Sunday that we will have Christmas trees out with Prison Fellowship Angels on them. It is our, um, um, our, our, the kickoff of, of what we do with Prison Fellowship to where we help um, children at Christmas time. Many children have a mom or a dad or on some occasions both parents are incarcerated. And one of the most difficult times for the families of those who are incarcerated is Christmas time. And so we step in and try to fill a gap. Uh, the parent on the inside of prison signs up for this with prison fellowship. There's kind of a screening process. Then there is a follow-up with the family on the outside to make sure it's appropriate and permissible. And once that is done, that child's name is put on an angel. Some information about that child is also on the angel. And then those of us here at church, we take that angel with that name. We buy a gift with a value of $25. The value not to exceed $25 just because you can get something for $100 for $25. Don't do that. The value of the gift should not exceed $25. Uh, you bring that gift back here, and we package those gifts into bags for the children in that family, and then those, those are delivered. And we do this in the name of that parent who's incarcerated and in the love of Jesus Christ. And what a difference this makes in the lives of those children at Christmas time. And so those angels will be out and available for you next Sunday. Uh, it's also volunteer Volunteer Appreciation Day next Sunday, and our deacons are going to be recognizing all of our volunteers who've served our church over the past year. And we say thanks once again for those of you who volunteered to help host the memorial service for uh, yesterday's funeral service that we had here uh, for Stephen, Lori's husband, uh, Bridgem. And um, uh, Stephen Bridgem was a violin craftsman. He made violins and he repaired violins. Most unusual profession. And uh, we had the Philharmonia instrumental trio here. They played in his honor, and then we had another uh, duet of violinists who played. It was absolutely beautiful, and uh, I, I love the way God sometimes does things. I had a man who came by to see me this past week. I'd never met him in my life. Uh, he'd been at a service three or four months ago, and uh, that prompted some questions, and he wanted to come talk about it, and in the course of that, he said, do you guys have a worship team at your church? And I said, yes, yes, we do. And he said, what kind of instruments play in your worship? And I kind of told him all this. And he said, doesn't sound like you have a violinist. I said, no, we don't. He said, well, I play violin. And I said, well, awesome. And uh, I said, you play violin? By any chance, do you know Stephen Bridgem? He said, he took care of my violin. And I said, well, we're honoring him tomorrow in our service here. And so um, I've never met a violin maker before. I didn't know that when I met Steve. That's what he did. So uh, please be praying for Lori, his wife, uh, for her encouragement and strength during these days. Uh, but thank all of you volunteers. Some of you brought food. Some of you came to help set up. Some of you served. Some of you helped to clean up. And it takes all of that to minister to families at a time like this in our community. So we're going to say thank you to all of you who've done that throughout the year next Sunday. Parents of uh, junior high and high school kids, please take note of the meeting for all of you next Sunday after our third service. There's a sign-up sheet that's going to go around, and there's two things on it. The thing on the back page is... Um 
many have already signed. We've taken those sheets off, but this is if you're going to be attending the Thanksgiving lunch for our seniors. If you are 55 or older, you qualify. Come have lunch here at the church. There is going to be turkey and ham and mashed potatoes and gravy and dressing, and the church is providing all of that for you. You may bring a side dish or a dessert to add to that. If it's your first time, don't bring anything. Just bring yourself. But we would like to know uh, as close as we can how many are going to be here so we make sure we have enough of those things that are there. So that's the back sign-up sheet. If you have not signed up already, please do that today. On the front is something uh, something new. Actually, it's something just decided on this week. Uh, I'm going to teach a little class from November the 29th to December 13th on Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. We're probably going to meet over in the office building, uh, depending on the size of the class. But uh, between Thanksgiving and Christmas, we as a church have a wonderful time, opportunity to share our faith in ways that we never can any other time of the year, just heading into the Christmas season. And so we're going to do three weeks on a Wednesday night. Uh, we're going to talk about how can we share our faith during this particular season in a two or three minute time period. And so that's what we're going to do on Wednesday night. So if you want to come be a part of that on Wednesday evening from 7 to 8, please sign up. That is on the front. So we have enough materials and know what room will be appropriate for us to meet in. Uh, let's see here. Let's fawn. We've got a special event coming up for the ladies. Good morning, y'all. We have our women's ornament exchange on November 27th. This year's theme is country Christmas. That's what I said, Michael. So feel free to wear your cowboy boots or Christmassy outfits. We're going to have a lot of fun this year. Um, you will be served dinner. We've been doing desserts the last couple of years. This year is dinner, but it is a buffet dinner, so you don't have to get up and get it yourself, but you still get to eat with us. And we're having special entertainment, the Gilly Girls. Now, some of you that may have come to the senior event last month got to enjoy them. Um, well, they're going to back and, and uh, uh, perform for all of us. They're, they're four talented sisters, uh, young ladies. They're beautiful, have beautiful voices, and just uh, tremendously talented on their instruments, and they're going to be singing us some Christmas carols. And then we will have our ornament exchange. So remember, please bring a wrapped ornament to exchange with the other ladies when you come. The tickets go on sale next week, the 12th, out of the pavilion, and they are only $5 each. As usual, we are limited to the amount of space that we have, so it's first come, first serve, so you don't procrastinate. And I hope to see you ladies there. We have a great time as usual. Thank you. Thank you, Fawn. Thank you very much. The Gilly Girls are terrific. The Gilly Girls are two pairs of twin sisters. All right, two pairs of twin sisters. Yes. Oh, okay. Well, well, we have a, we have a pair of twins in church today with us. All right, there's right over there. They're four months old, and they are so. Yeah. Oh, okay. Now that I've said that, everybody wants to see. Hold one of them up. All right. There we go. And if you've seen one, you've seen them both. All right, they're twins. That, <laughs> I'm, I'm just kidding. I don't know if they're identical twins. Are, are, are they identical? T they're fraternal twins. All right, all right. So uh, I was just kidding. But welcome. It's great to have uh, them and their parents with us today. Um, I really could barely see them because they were in camouflage uh, baby things on the floor. So, uh, but, it, but it's awesome. I forgot what you call those things. No, bassinet's not right. It's a carrier, carrier. Thank you, baby carrier. Um, yeah, it's been a long time since I've had to have one of those. Um, okay, let's, let's talk about a few prayer requests, and then we'll get engaged in worship. It's good to see Vince Little here today. I was going to talk about him. Uh, but he's had his second, this, i got to say this slowly, or it comes out badly, his second shoulder surgery. Try to say shoulder surgery real fast. <laughs> yeah, it's really hard, isn't it? In six weeks. And so glad to see him up and about and, and looking good, all right? He doesn't even look drug-induced at the moment, so that's wonderful. That's wonderful. So continue to pray for him for his recovery. Uh, Joni Kolb, as I shared with you last Sunday, her mom passed away. Uh, that service is this afternoon at 2 o'clock in, in Selma at the Selma Christian Church. And so please be praying for Joni. Let her know that you're thinking about her. Helen Heath had surgery this past Friday. She is home and recuperating well. Be praying for Heidi Stahl. She's going to be going in for surgery. Uh, so remember her, and uh, I've already shared with you, remember to pray for, uh, for Lori and the unexpected, the unexpected death of her husband, Stephen. So just be remembering them. She has family here from Oklahoma and Canada and Oregon, and so uh, just be praying for her as well. I'm going to ask our ushers to come forward, wait on us as we have our morning tithes and offering. Would you join with me as we pray, and then we'll engage in our worship. 
Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the life that you share with us. We thank you for your availability to our life and to our needs. Father, I want to say thank you that you provide your sufficiency to us, not just in the good seasons of our life, but you provide your sufficiency to us in the all seasons of our life. We, uh, we often don't recognize that you are available 24-7 every day of every week, every week of every month, every month of every year for our entire life. You never take a day off from being available for us. But Father, we are so selective in how much we make our life available to you. We choose sometimes the days of the week. We sometimes choose the hours of a given day. We sometimes may even reserve it to just certain seasons of the year. And Father, I think we look back with regret when we look back and realize that we tried to do things all by ourselves. So thank you for your patience and thank you for your tender heart towards us that you forgive us of our frailties and you are there to prompt us to remember, I am here. Trust me, depend upon me, rest in me, talk to me, I am here. You're a perfect gentleman. You never force your way. You never demand your will in our lives. But the Scripture says you stand lovingly knocking at our door saying, let me in. I can take care of this for you. I can give you what you need. So, Father, if some of us look back over the course of this week and discover how frequently we left you on the door stoop. Thank you that you are still just as excited to come in today as you were yesterday. And may we let you do that. Father, we've expressed so many needs to need to today, needs of those who have experienced loss in their lives recently. Father, we have a half a dozen folks in our congregation going through radiation and chemotherapy. We got great news from Bernice's daughter Charlene this week from Stanford that all of her counts are where they need to be. She's doing so well, and we, we rejoice over that good news. We thank you for your availability when the news wasn't good, and we also thank you today for when the news is good. We're grateful. Father, I pray that our hearts will be open to what you have to share with us today, that as we, as we expose our lives to your word, that we will let your word do its work in each of us. We say thanks in advance, knowing you're big enough for that task. For the privilege of giving and sharing today, Father, it is an expression of our gratitude for all that you have done for us with a little of what we give back to you. And Father, if your desire is that our little become more, may you find very gracious givers today. Givers to what you want to do in and through our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I invite you to um, find the Gospel of Luke, chapter 17. In a few minutes, we're going to be uh, reading a few verses out of uh, Luke, chapter 17. We've uh, just finished about uh, three and a half months out of the Old Testament looking at a couple of uh, the little minor prophet books called uh, Habakkuk and Haggai. And uh, since this is the kickoff to the month of November and Thanksgiving, we're going to spend a few weeks looking at the subject of thankfulness and gratitude. And we're going to do that today by looking at a, a passage out of, um, out of Luke's Gospel. Um, most of you know there are four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, yeah. And the Gospels basically are the story of the life of Jesus Christ told from the perspective of four different men who knew him very well, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And uh, you also know, if you've read the Gospels before, that there are some similarities between the four Gospels. There are some things, uh, some of the stories and the events of Jesus', Jesus life that are told in all four. There are some that are told in three out of the four and others in two out of the four. And, and all those are just, uh, it's kind of like if, if all of us were at a party and we all wrote about the party that we went to, we would be sharing it from our different perspective. And uh, that's what's happening in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And there are occasions, uh, a bit of Jesus' life that is told in just one of the four Gospels. And the story that we're looking at today it seems very, very appropriate that Luke is the one 
who, if there's going to be just one of them who tells the story, this particular story is best told by Luke. If you've done much research, you've been around church much, you know that Luke was a doctor. Luke was the most educated, well-educated, out of the four gospel writers. Uh, Matthew was a tax collector. He was, um, <laughs> he was good at business. <laughs> um, or he was good at getting money out of your business. Um, that, was, that was Matthew's path. Before. Uh, you, you, got, uh, you got John. Uh, that is God calling a chaplain, all right? <laughs> Literally, he's a police chaplain. He's on call. Um, and, and then you got, uh, you, you got John, who is a, a fisherman, not, not well educated, not necessarily uh, prolific with business, but John knew how to work and knew how to work hard. And so we get a little different perspective from each of them. And Dr. Luke, if we're going to read a story about lepers, Luke is the one to tell us the story. And that's what we're going to be looking at in just a few moments. We're looking at these, uh, we're, we're looking at these lepers today uh, from a perspective of not necessarily their leprosy, but though that's a vital part of the story, we're looking at their gratitude. We're looking at how, how do people respond when good things happen in bad situations, how do people respond in those moments? As we look at these 10 men in this chapter, I don't want this just to be a historical journey looking at an old story. I want this to be a contemporary reflection. Where do we find ourselves in this story? It doesn't do us any good to look at Scripture and only learn the truths of Scripture. The truths of Scripture, God has kept them throughout time for the purpose and the purpose is that they become a mirror to our own life. And so as we look at the reflection of Luke chapter 17, verses 11 through 19, what reflection of ourselves do we see in this story? Number two, what reflection would we like to see of ourselves in this story? What, what would we like to change so that we are seeing a different reflection of ourselves in the story? So we're going to be looking at the subject um, of gratitude. There was a woman who was uh, visiting some people who lived on a farm. As she was walking around the farm, she noticed that there was a pig limping in their backyard. As she got a little closer look at the family pig, she noticed the reason for the limp. This pig had a wooden leg. She went up to the farmer very curious and said, Sir, could you tell me why does your pig have a wooden leg. And he said, oh, our pig, that's Betsy. We love Betsy. She's, she's a wonderful, wonderful pig. We, we are very grateful for her. You, you see, one night, a fire got started in our house, and we were all asleep. And Betsy run to our door and oinked so loud it woke us up that we were able to call the fireman in time to come and put the fire out before it destroyed our house. We, we love Betsy. And, 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 you know, Betsy also saved our youngest daughter's life. She fell in the pond, and none of us were outside, and Betsy ran to the door of the house. Oink so loud, she got our attention, led us back to the pond, and we were able to save our daughter before she died. We, we love Betsy. We're very grateful for her. And the woman said, well, that's wonderful. That explains why you love Betsy, but why does Betsy have a wooden leg? And the farmer said, well, when you have a pig that special, you don't want to eat her all at once. Oh, you see, gratitude only went so far, all right? And I'm afraid that's a reflection of nine out of the ten characters in our story today. Their gratitude only went so far. There were several churches in North Dakota that were being served by one older retired pastor. The people were always amazed that no matter what the circumstances of life were like, this preacher could always find something to be grateful for. As he made his rounds one very, very cold December morning, he was late in getting to the place of worship that day because there were excessive snowdrifts on the road and he had to work his way around them. After he began this service that started late with prayer, the members of that congregation were very 
very, very eager to see how this old preacher was going to come up with something to be thankful for on this very tough and frigid morning. And so he began, gracious Lord, we thank you that all of our days are not like today. I like that. Here is a, a man who understood well what Paul wrote in the book of Philippians when he said, I've learned the secret, I've discovered the mystery of what it means to be content in any and every situation I find myself. Here's a man who understands what it means to pray in the pattern that Paul gave a few verses earlier in that same chapter in Philippians chapter 4 with prayer and supplication. What's the next phrase? With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to the Lord. In, every and every, in any and every circumstance, and before the prayer is even answered, Paul says, with gratitude, share your needs. Not as a beggar, coming with the idea that maybe help will come, but as a confident child to a father knowing in advance the help is already on its way. It was my father-in-law, Ted Watson, who used to say that gratitude is an expression of a deepening faith. That when we say thanks to God before we have seen his handiwork in our circumstances, we have confidence in him. If there is one sin and I thought long and hard about that this week. Is it appropriate for me to call ingratitude sin? I had to go all the way back to what I finally settled on many, many years ago was going to be what I thought was my appropriate biblical definition of sin. You see, often in church what we do is we like to describe sin rather than define sin because it makes us feel better about our small sins. Or it enables us to not even call some things sin, which probably are. See, we like, the difference between describing and defining sin is this. Adultery, lying, murder, that's describing sin. All of those things are the symptom of sin that has already taken root in your heart. They are, the, they are the fruit of what I believe real sin is. And the, and the reason I say that is because when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, did they commit adultery? Did they lie? Did they steal? Yeah, maybe. It was a tree they said, don't touch. Okay? So, eh. but, but we see, that, that, that was the outcome of what real sin was. See, here, here's the definition I've settled on that I think is biblically correct. Sin is independence from God. And when I settled on that, that was very troubling for me. Because it meant that I could preach a sermon on Sunday morning and sin. I heard some preachers when I grew up who sinned when they preached because they were mad at somebody in the church and that sermon was directed at one person. Do you ever go to a church like that where that happens sometimes? I went to chapel sometimes in Bible college. My buddy Bruce Wood and I, we knew there were some sermons preached at us by the president of the Bible college and all, they were right at the two of us. We knew that, and quite frankly, so did the rest of the student body. They knew who they were talking to. That is not a message that comes from God. That's a message that satisfies a preacher's anger or frustration. You could teach a Sunday school class and sin. 
You can, you can make a large contribution to a biblically-based group and sin because you did it in independence from God. So when we understand the definition of sin, I think it brings us to a place where we learn how much we have to be grateful for, for a God who loves us, who has forgiven us, and who has provided for us everything that we need for life and for godliness. And so I finally settled this week in saying I think ingratitude probably is a description of sin. It is not the definition of sin, but it is a description of sin, just like lying and adultery. You see, God has done so much on our behalf, and our indebtedness to him is enormous, and yet our offering of thanks often is so very small. In fact, according to a a Barna poll, that's a Christian organization kind of like Gallup, most professing Christians don't even offer thanks for their meals, much less give thanks for what God has done in their lives. We're much more like the little boy who was given an orange by a man, and the boy's mother looked at her son and said, Son, what do you have to say to the nice man? And the little boy thought about it. He handed the orange back to the man and said, Peel it. I have to be honest. I saw a little bit of that Halloween night. Um... My neighbors did their best to prepare me for what Halloween was going to be like in our new neighborhood. Some of you, if you're new or visiting here today, I lived in the country. We lived in the country for 29 years. Uh, We never had trick-or-treaters at our doorstep, okay, in the country, because kids don't want to walk that far between houses. Okay, they, they want it convenient. Uh, when, our, when our boys were little, uh, we sometimes had trick-or-treaters because they were their friends in the neighborhood, and they would never come to the front door. They came to our back door, walked in, and said, what do you got for me? And, and, and th- that's not a bad thing about them because we'd said, hey, come over and get what we've got for you, all right, because that's all we had. We had four or five of them, and that was it. Well, our neighbors told us, hey, there's going to be 1,000 kids through the neighborhood. okay. Shelly went out and bought candy that afternoon. She waited till it went to half off, and she bought $100 worth of candy nearly. We were going to be ready for 1,000 kids. Our neighbors lied. <laughs> there was 1,500 kids if there was one that came through our neighborhood. And I, I'm not exaggerating, am I? I am not exaggerating. We, we, went, and did, uh, we went and did Halloween with Bo, uh, you know, in their neighborhood in downtown, uh, downtown Clovis. And, and we, we were out for about an hour walking, you know, hitting just a few houses where they knew folks. And we saw about 30 other trick-or-treaters in that hour. It was, it was good. And so when we drive back to our house and we're going to finish out the evening handing out candy in our neighborhood, you know, until I turned onto our street. It took us about four minutes to go a block and a half. It was worse than Christmas in Candy Cane Lane, and the reason is is because it wasn't cars in the middle of the road. It was literally herds of kids, 40 and 50 of them. Am I exaggerating? I am not exaggerating. 40 and 50 kids in herds, all right, right in the middle of the road. No parents to keep them out of the middle of the street. So it took forever. To get I told Shelly, I said, we're not opening our door. She said, what about the candy? I said, we'll give it to the Belchers, all right? They're already out, okay? So they were, they were on their front porch, and so we snuck through our backyard. You know, we got over to the Belchers, and we said, here, you want some candy? They said, no, when we finish what we bought, we're going in. But, 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 but Tim was out to hit it right. I'll be ready next year, all right? I'll be out on a driveway. I'll have my chair, all right? They'll just come by, because I'm not getting up 1,500 times to answer a door, all right? That's crazy. Um, but, 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 but here's, here's what I observed from a couple of kids at, at the Belcher's residence, okay? Uh, first of all, there were, there were some kids whose parents were with them up at the doorstep, and then they would tell their kids, now what do you say? And they were cute. They would say thank you. And then there would be kids who would come up who didn't have a costume at all on, and they had a, they had a pillowcase, and they were about 15, Fawn, Fawn, I love this. We told this story. Fawn said, I told one kid who came up without anything on, are you kidding me? You won't even dress up and you want me to give you candy? Get out of here. Yeah. I think her house got egged later, but all right. You know. 
<laughs> but, but, well, yeah, like, like praying or worshiping or, you know. <laughs> Okay. But, but, but then I watched, I, 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 I watched this one kid when, when Tim was about ready to give him something. He said, no, I don't like that kind. <laughs> Didn't he? I'm, Barbara's my witness. He said, no, I don't like that kind. And he went through about three ones before he got to one that he liked. And then I watched this other little girl, and, she went, and, and Tim gave her something, and then she kept standing there with her bag out, and, 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 and then she reached over, and she took another one, and she took another one, and she took another one. And finally, about number five, her dad said, I think that's enough. Gratitude. It's in kind of short supply. And am I blaming the kids out at Halloween? Only a little. They've, it's learned behavior. It's learned behavior from not only their family, but community that we live in here. Peel it. For a child of God, thankfulness ought not to be confined to a day or to a season Gratitude is an attitude that ought to be as consistent as our heartbeat. We sang a song today about it is your breath in my lungs. Gratitude ought to be as consistent in us as the children of God, as the representatives of God on earth. We are those representatives not by any merit of our own good behavior. We are his representative by his incredible love for us and his grace grace towards us. And with every breath we take and every heartbeat that happens, we ought to be as consistent with our gratitude as that. To magnify this point, I want to examine this account of ten lepers in Luke's gospel, and I want to search for some important truths concerning this subject. Now, we need to understand a couple of things. The story of lepers loses a lot of its power in our 21st century lifestyle. It loses a lot because, one, how many of you have ever seen a leper in your life? So talking about a leper... Doesn't mean a whole lot to you, does it? We've read about it, maybe. But trust me, when this was written, um, let's see if I can make a connection. Some of you who are under 30, this won't even make sense to you. Um, Remember when the AIDS and HIV scare was at its peak? Remember when Magic Johnson came out with, with his story? Everybody was terrified. Now, now imagine. Imagine if the law of our country required a person who was, was HIV infected. Imagine if the law of our country required of us now what being a leper was then, and that is if you came anywhere close to somebody else, you had to say, I'm clean! I'm clean! HIV! You had to yell it. What if you had to live in a secured location? Most of these lepers around Jerusalem, not not where this took place, but the lepers around Jerusalem, they were exiled to a place called the Valley of Gehenna. The word that is used very frequently in the New Testament for hell is the word Gehenna. Not because it was a word that had meaning, but because it was the name of a place that gave the word meaning. The Valley of Gehenna was a very deep ravine just outside the city limits of Jerusalem. And imagine where you've got a couple of hundred thousand people living. You don't have routine garbage collection. So where do you take your garbage? The residents would take their garbage out to this this deep ravine called Gehenna. And they would dump their garbage over the edge and it would roll down to the bottom of the valley there, the ravine. And how do you dispose of garbage in those days particularly? You set fire to it. The flames of Gehenna never died because the fuel of human garbage never stopped being dumped into the valley. The smoke from the garbage would roll up the side walls of that that, that, that rigid ravine. And inside those walls of that ravine called the Valley of Gehenna were small caves. 
Guess who lived in the small caves of the valley of hell? The lepers. How would you like to live in a place where your friends and neighbors came and dumped their garbage right over the entranceway of the place that you lived in and the smoke from that garbage rolled up into the entrance of your cave day and night, day and night? That was the life of a leper. Not everybody who had a skin disease had leprosy. But they didn't have the means of diagnosis that we have today. And so often somebody with a skin disease that looked like it could lead to the advanced stages of leprosy would be exiled outside the city. And do you know who they had to go to in order to be determined whether they were unclean or clean? They went to the high priests. Not that high priests had medical experience, but it was there. Because see, they thought leprosy was connected to sin. It's become an image and a picture of sin, symbolic of sin, but, it, but it's not an indication of sin. But, but they often thought it was. And so the high priest would make a determination as they looked at their skin. Yes, that's leprosy. You're exiled. You're unclean. But if after applying some ointment or just getting away from the stress of daily living, if your skin cleared up, you could go back to the high priest. He would do an examination of you. And if he determined you to be clean, then you had permission to come back into town and to hang out with your family and friends and go back to work again. So I think those things are important to know if this story is going to have impact on us today. This was some severe circumstances. So let's, um, let's make a few observations. As we begin to read this, we're going to notice a few things in this account of the lepers. First, um, we're going to see that all ten of them were cleansed and healed. The second thing, we're going to notice that the celebration of gratitude only involved one. And it was the least likely of the one who did the most likely thing, a Samaritan. Again, a Samaritan, that term loses punch in 21st century culture. I will pick on my background so that way nobody can think I'm being insulting to someone else. I'm a card-carrying member of the Choctaw Nation. I'm part Native American. My grandfather who was very proud, he said he was an Indian. Apparently we can't use that term anymore. But think of what it was like in this country in the late 1800s and the early 1900s and you showed up at school and your skin was a bit darker complected and your hair was black and your eyes were like coal and they called you half-breed. That was a Samaritan. And they were shunned. And they were ignored, and they were looked down upon, particularly by religion. And the last thing this story will tell us is the least likely, who did the thing that was most likely, he was saved. He was not just healed, he was saved. The passage begins... I've kind of put together a few different translations as I read through my verses just because of certain words I want to emphasize. You're welcome to follow along in your own Bible. If you have a King James or a New King James, these words are going to begin, verse 11, and it came to pass. If you have an NIV or probably an NAS, those words are not there. Um, the phrase, and it came to pass, literally means, and, and it just happened. It so happens. It's left out of a lot of more modern translations because they think it doesn't add meaning to the passage. They think it's just a filler phrase. I would like to suggest to you it has great meaning that this thing which just happened, God in his sovereign knowledge is engaged in the happenings of our life. That God is concerned about the everyday things. Of our, and so it happened and God was present. It so happened here that as Jesus was going up to Jerusalem, and he was going there to die for our sins, he passed through the borderlands between Samaria and Galilee. Notice the sense of purpose about everything that Jesus was doing. He had a purpose for where he went and when he went there. The passage continues in verse 12. And on his entering a certain village, ten leprous men stood where? Afar off. 
This little community of suffering kept their distance, which was appropriate to their condition, and it was in the keeping of the law of that country, according to Leviticus chapter 13. Verse 13, these ten men collectively lifted up their voices. What does that mean? They yelled. They shouted. Yeah. They shouted, Jesus, Master, have compassion on us. The word had even got to the leper colony who Jesus was. And it's good that we recognize that our help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. That's what David said in Psalm 121, verses uh, 1 and 2. The Lord knows our situation, and sometimes a simple prayer, Lord have mercy, is sufficient. Verse 14, upon seeing their condition, Jesus said, having, having gone, show yourselves to the priest. Go. Show yourselves to the priest. It's no use arguing over whether we have enough faith or not. This seemed to be a call for urgent and immediate action. Go. Show yourself. And the scripture says, they went. May I just make a suggestion? Anytime God tells you to go, you ought to went. Okay? You, you Really, you should. You ought to go. Uh, if he says it, we shouldn't really argue or debate about it. And you know what? Not a one of these ten lepers argued or debated. Here's what's interesting, though, the next phrase. And it just so happened that as they were going, they were cleansed. Notice something important. They couldn't look at their hands and their arms and their feet and see that they were healed before they went. In the journey of going, God's grace did its work in their lives. Somewhere along the journey from where they encountered Jesus to where they were going to the one who had determined them unclean, they noticed they were being cleaned. They were being cleansed. The sores, the pus dried up and was gone. The ugly scars and wounds were going away. The dry skin was becoming healthy again. The sores in their feet and the pain they had when they walked, it left them. And somewhere between point A and point B, they were healed. Verse 15, just one of these former lepers, in seeing that he was healed, turned back, and with a loud voice, he glorified God, prostrating himself, throwing himself at the feet of Jesus. This man gave thanks to him. At this point, Luke emphasizes, this man was a Samaritan. And, and here's the indication. The other nine were probably Jews. And those nine Jews would have never hung out with a Samaritan except they discovered they had one huge thing in common. They were all lepers. And you got sh you're short of friends. <laughs> so you can't kick any of them out. And the appearance is nine religious Jewish men who should have known better than to be ungrateful were. And the one who had every reason to be ungrateful wasn't. Verse 17, Jesus then asked the question, well, weren't there ten of you? Now, do you think Jesus didn't remember how many there were? I think this is a tongue firmly planted in his cheek. Well, weren't there ten of you? And I'm convinced it's a tongue in cheek with the next line. So where's the other nine? Uh, Jesus wasn't caught by surprise that he was a Samaritan either. Uh, it seemed amazing to Jesus that the only one returning to give glory to God was an outsider. Again, we notice three quick things. Uh, Jesus spoke to this man in resurrection terms. Notice the last phrase in verse 19. Then he said to him, rise and go. Rise. It's the same words that Jesus said to a crippled man. Take up your bed and walk. It's the same thing that was going to happen to Jesus inside a tomb. He is what? Risen. He's not here. How could that be that he's not here? Because he is risen. Jesus said, leper, you're a leper no more. Samaritan, 
That's not your definition of who you are anymore. Rise, my child, and go. Rise. The second, Jesus spoke of a faith that saves. Your faith has made you whole. You see the other nine lepers? All that was saved was their flesh. The outside of the cup cleaned up. But nothing different took place inside. The one who came back and threw himself at the feet of Jesus. Jesus said, today you've been saved. Not just physically. You have now been saved from the inside out. You see, religion just cleans up the outside of the cup. It's Jesus who takes care of the inside of our lives. I want you to notice that um, the, 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 the position of all ten of these is they stood afar off. Just, just know, uh, all of them. That, that's the condition of all of us apart from Jesus Christ. We all stand afar off. These lepers were cut off from their family. Nobody knows how long it had been since they had felt the touch of their spouse or the hug or kiss of one of their children all of these men were shut off from their friends. Friends no longer came over to hang out with them. And none of their friends invited them to their home. They were cut off from the fellowship of their religion. And from their perspective, they had been shut off from God the Father. You see, they, they were in an awful position. But they recognized in their awful position that they were also in an approachable position the day that Jesus walked by. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. You want to know my Father? Fall in love with me and I'll take you to my Father. I am grateful that where the laws of men and religion cannot go, Jesus goes anyway. What the law declares off limits, Jesus boldly goes in where no others will. When the law passes on the other side, Jesus makes a point to come in contact with us. Are you approachable to the Lord today? That's the position of us all. We are in an awful position in our sin. But God loves us so much, he approaches us right where we are. The prayer of all. All ten of them cried out in unison. It was a choir. Hey, Lord, save us. Pay attention to us. Very simple prayer. Lord, have mercy on us. You see, their observation is, is here was somebody coming who might be able to do something with their need, with their problem. And when Jesus gave them direction, they obeyed just, just so far. As soon as they got healed, they forgot about the one who healed them. And notice the praise of one. What's the odds on gratitude? According to this parable, one out of ten. According to the odds of this parable, ten percent of you sitting in this audience today are appropriately grateful. The other ninety percent of us are not. I hope we can change those odds. The one took the opportunity to praise. Here's what I find remarkable. One loved his wife and children just as much as the other nine. One wanted to hug and kiss his kids just as much as the others. One wanted to spend time with his friends. One wanted to enjoy the blessings just like the other nine. But one had his priorities right. One did not get so wrapped up in the blessing that he forgot the blesser. One put family and friends and fellowship in its right position of priority in his life so that he could worship the one that made his being with his family and his friends possible. And I want you to notice, in the same way that he called out to God for help, in a loud voice he glorified God as well. It's amazing how loud we scream when we need help. It's amazing how quiet we get when we say thanks. How grateful are we? How much do we let God know how grateful we are for what he's done for us? You see, nine of them received a healing from a distance, 
But this one's healing went more than just skin deep. It went all the way to his soul. God wants to do that for us. And once we've let him do it, we ought to be grateful with every breath we take, with every beat of our heart. Let me close. It's a story I've told before. It's one of my all-time favorites on gratitude. It is gratitude that prompted an old man to visit an old broken pier on the eastern seacoast of Florida. Every Friday night until he died in 1973, this old man would return, walking slowly, deliberately, slightly stooped with a large bucket of shrimp. The seagulls would flock to this old man. They would, just, they would surround his feet, and he would feed them hand to mouth from his bucket. Why did he do it? Because many years before, in October of 1942, Captain Eddie Rickenbacker was on a mission on a B-17 to deliver a very important message to General Douglas MacArthur in New Guinea. But there was an unexpected detour which would hurl Captain Eddie into the most harrowing adventure of his life. Somewhere over the South Pacific, the flying fortress became lost beyond the reach of a radio. Fuel ran low, so the men ditched their plane in the ocean. For nearly a month, Captain Eddie and his companions would fight the water, the weather, and the scorching sun. They spent many sleepless nights recoiling as giant sharks rammed into their raft. The largest raft they had was nine feet by five feet. The biggest shark they faced was ten feet long. But of all their enemies at sea, one proved the most formidable. Starvation. Eight days out, their rations were gone or destroyed by the salt water. It would take a miracle to sustain them, and a miracle occurred in a most unexpected way. In Captain Eddie's own words, Cherry, that was the B-17 pilot, Captain William Cherry, read the service that afternoon, and we finished the service with a prayer for deliverance, and listen to this, and a hymn of praise. There was some talk, but it tapered off in the oppressive heat. With my hat pulled down over my eyes to keep out the glare of the sun, I dozed a little. Now this is still Captain Rickenbacker talking. Something all of a sudden landed on my head. I just knew it was a seagull. I don't know how I knew, I just knew. Everyone else knew too. No one said a word. But peering out from under the brim of my hat without moving my head, I could see the expression on the other faces. They were staring at the gull. The gull meant food, if I could catch it. And the rest, as they say, is history. By the way, this is a Paul Harvey rest of the story story. <laughs> Captain Eddie caught the gull. Its flesh was eaten. Its intestines were used for bait to catch fish. The survivors were sustained and their hopes renewed because one lone seagull, uncharacteristically hundreds of miles away from land, offered himself as a sacrifice. Well, we know that Captain Eddie made it because until 1973... He walked the shores of Florida with a bucket of shrimp. Captain Eddie never forgot. Every Friday at sunset on a lonely stretch of beach, you could see the old man walking, white-haired, bushy eyebrow, slightly bent, his bucket filled with shrimp to feed the gulls, to remember the one which on a day long past gave itself without a struggle, like manna in a wilderness, and like the Son of God on a cross. With every breath, with every beat of our heart, in any and every circumstance, we ought to show a deepening faith with gratitude. Let's pray. Our Father, what else really is there to say today but thanks. Even if this is really, really a bad day or a bad season in our life, 
the old preacher from North Dakota has taught us well today. Lord, we thank you that every day is not like today. Father, thank you that you are the difference maker in our life. May we not just take your blessings and ignore you, but may we learn from a, from a sick Samaritan man who got made whole from the inside out. I hope we've learned the lesson well today. In Jesus' name, we give you thanks. Amen. Amen. Go have a great day.